Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm uh, Vaughan Voller, and I'm, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Professor Shui Feng. Uh, Shui is currently a Minnesota, University of Minnesota McKnight Land Grant Professor, and following degrees, let's, let's try and get this in the right order, Stanford, Duke, and a NOAA postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley, she joined our faculty in, I was going to ask you before, but I think it was 2017, right? Good, I've got that right. I was trying to work out on my fingers how long you've been here, and I got that, so 2017. And um, Shui's research focus, which she's going to go into some detail today, is looking at, with her students and postdocs, how small-scale water cycling processes, for example, a single plant, it uptakes and releases water, and understanding those small scale processes with a view of integrating them up into the larger scale so you can understand how water is used and recycled at the scale of a watershed, but actually by integrating the mechanics at the small scale to get much more reliable models, which is probably an essential element of developing effective climate change tools. So I'll let Sway explain further. I see some people looking puzzled, but Sway will throw a light on what I just said. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Sway. All right, well, thank you very much. Good, on, good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about how we improve predictions of ecosystem responses through ecohydrological feedbacks. All right, my research is motivated by trying to understand the land use and climate change uh, effects on water and carbon cycles. And currently, Land surface models and watershed models are two of our main goals for doing that, but sometimes they can be inaccurate because they fail to capture small scale processes and connect them to the ecosystem level responses. And so to improve their predictions, we really need to do a better job of upscaling these uh, ecohydrological interactions between water and uh, microbes and plants and upscale them accurately into ecosystem level predictions. And um, and this is an important effort because we know that land surface and watershed models are some of our fundamental tools for making a wide range of important decisions like how we manage stormwater, how we harvest trees from a forest, how we anticipate risk of floods, how we avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And so to that end, the goals in our group are to one, advance the process understanding and representation of these hydrological processes at smaller scales, and then connect them back um, to ecosystems and watersheds through a range of methods, statistical, computational, observational, and analytical tools so that we can improve the prediction of carbon and water uh, fluxes. And so in this talk, I'll take you through three examples where um, these ecosystem level responses can be tied back to interactions between water and these small scale um, life forms. And so the first will be the hydrological controls on peatland carbon emissions. The second part will involve vegetation and forest responses to droughts. The third will be vegetation impacts on urban hydrology. And so if we start in the peatlands, the main players here are microbes and they produce carbon byproducts as a part of decomposing plant material. And um, they, their function tends to be re regulated by water availability. We care about peatlands because Despite covering only about 3% of the land surface, they um, store anywhere from a third to a half of all of the world's soil carbon. And they store a lot of carbon because peatlands tend to be perennially inundated by water, and water tends to inhibit the uh, diffusion of oxygen into the water column. And so that reduces decomposition rates of dead plant material that, um, that the microbes would have otherwise decomposed. And so as climate change increases air temperature, we would expect that these decomposition rates will also start to increase along with the rate of release of these carbon byproducts like CO2 and methane back into the atmosphere. So to study the sensitivity of peatlands to climate change and to look at their long-term trends, we focus on long-term data sets from the Marcel Experimental Forest. 
So Marcel is established by the US Forest Service in 1962. And since then they've collected a bunch of hydrological and meteorological information um, as part of their mission. And so you can see that some of these old analog uh, equipment are still in use today. This is a runoff collector measuring subsurface, shallow subsurface flow. And they coexist with more modern equipment like this Eddie Colbringer's tower that's continuously measuring carbon dioxide and methane fluxes from the, the fen. And because this is such a unique site for study questions at the frontiers of climate change, and also because it's like only four hours drive north of here, um, we've also installed our own field equipment there to complement existing infrastructure. The data set that I'll talk about today involves this 11 years record of methane emissions from the peatland. This is one of the longest recorded, um, published, and continuously measured methane fluxes in the world, the other one being in Finland. And um, it allows us to look at long-term year-to-year variability in methane emissions. And we're interested in methane because it's a, it's a much more powerful and potent greenhouse gas compared to CO2. So on this graph here, you'll see water table variations over 11 years on the top, methane emissions in the middle, um, soil temperature underneath that tower that I showed on the previous slide on the bottom. And from this, you can see that there's actually quite a lot of year to year variability. There's about 2.4 fold the difference between the highest emitting years and the lowest emitting years. And these are color coded annually by their minimum to maximum range within that 12 or 11 year period in their uh, in these respective time series. And so the variability in methane emissions actually follow quite closely to the variations in the soil temperature measured. And you can see that the highest emitting years tend to co-occur with the warmest years. But that's not necessarily the case for correlation between emissions and water table. And in fact, the water table elevations within a year exhibit a very high variability and there's not a clear trend um, that you might see during the summer of drying. So we wanna understand the thermal and hydrological drivers of uh, what accounts for interannual variability in these methane emissions. And to do that, we hypothesize that while soil temperature is the primary driver of methane fluxes, the seasonal water table elevations will also control the sensitivity of emission um, of, uh, of methane emissions to soil temperature. So to test this hypothesis, we divided those 11 year record annually into um, three different seasons, the dormant, the warming, and the cooling. The warming uh, phase is defined as between when the soil temperature, which is recorded in this red line here, start to rise in the spring until they reaches the peak during the middle of the summer. And then the rest of the year when it starts to cool down is defined as the cooling phase. And so we take those methane fluxes plotted against soil temperature on the right hand side during the warming phase, as well as during the, the, the cooling phase. And here we define this um, relationship between methane fluxes and soil temperature during the spring as the spring sensitivity when it warms up. And the difference between um, when it warms up and when it cools down as the fall hysteresis. And then we uh, correlated these indices against the water table elevation at the start of the warming and the cooling phase. So the results tell us that high water table elevations will slow the increase in methane fluxes during warming and slow the decrease in fluxes during cooling. And this is what it looks like. I'll maybe hop over to the side. Um, here we have this index of sensitivity that we defined. Oh, I'm supposed to stay within the line. Uh, defined here, uh, plotted against the average spring uh, water table elevations over those 11 years. And you can see this negative slope here indicates that the higher the spring water table is, the more. Um, or less, the more not sensitive, the, 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 the less sensitive the methane to soil temperature relationship is. And this can be contrasted by what happens during the summer when we have this hysteresis relationship plotted against the summer average water table elevations and increasing summer water table 
will lead to a higher hysteretic relationship between the methane fluxes and soil temperature, leading to a longer period of elevated methane fluxes. And so all of this is a little bit difficult to digest, but we summarize this in our paper by saying, during the warming phase, methane fluxes will increase more slowly under high water table elevation conditions, while during the cooling phase, methane fluxes will decrease more slowly under high water table conditions. So these mechanisms work together to keep peatlands more dormant during the warming phase and more activated during the cooling phase. And what this means is that if we somehow shift water availability from winter to summer, for example, through the effect of climate change, when the precipitation phase shifts from snow to rain, then this may result in higher annual methane emissions, even if soil temperature and their seasonal, seasonal profiles remain the same. And so the important contribution here is that we noted that um, it's not just the, the, the annual averages, but the seasonal dynamics of water table variations that is contributing to enhanced emissions from peatlands. And this also provided a key link um, for us of connecting between watershed level processes that control how water table uh, vary and, and, and their effects on microbial activities that lead to more emissions. So then this led us to look more into how these watershed level hydrological processes were represented in land surface models apply to peatlands. And so this is an area photo of Marcel. And you can see that in peatlands, you have these very distinct heterogeneous land surface features, like um, you have this bog with some saturated surface area that is surrounded by the upland forests around it. And when we look into how these are represented in models, we know that these distinct landscape features are sometimes just treated uniformly within the model grid. So spatial heterogeneity is neglected and the hydrological connections between them that lead to lateral flow sometimes are missing or under constrained as I've highlighted in the schematic here. And so to start to improve um, a representation of these hydrological processes. Maria and I focused on understanding what happens during this critical winter to spring transition. And um, Maria leveraged a lot of these long-term uh, data sets from Marcel, including precipitation that you see on the top, water table elevation here, um, snow depth here, and then spring flow or stream flow here to uh, to then apply signal processing to identify key events during the year. And so that includes when the snow depth reaches its peak and start to melt during the latter part of the winter that then goes into charging um, water table uh, from its trough and it starts to increase. And as uh, water tables start to increase and over uh, kind of uh, reaches a certain threshold, it initiates stream flow and then water, water table peaks and then that um, allows the stream flow to peak. And so Mario showed that there's a fairly clear sequence of flow pathways within uh, these peatland watersheds. And furthermore, we showed that soil frost actually is a key regulator of these sequence of events. So on the left, we have um, a negative relationship between the max frost thickness recorded in one of our our watersheds against the um, water table elevation uh, in, that, in that watershed that then feeds into stream flow. And so this is suggesting that the presence of frost can somehow perhaps disrupt the recharge of snow melt into those surface water storage components. On the right-hand side, um, we have the results from a stepwise regression analysis, where a lot of these predictor variables, such as snow depth and uh, frost depth, water table elevations, average temperature, total precipitation, these uh, candidate variables are added or removed progressively to construct a series of models that are then used to predict annual flow. And so, the top, um, there's a lot on the slide, but, but what this is showing is that of those best performing models as measured by the Akaike information criterion, inside of them, all of them contained soil frost as one of their predictor variables. And furthermore, if we weighed uh, 
these predictor variables using the weight assigned to each of those models where they exist, where they're selected, then soil frost actually emerged as one of the most, actually the most important predictor amongst all of the predictors that we explored. So what this is suggesting is that soil frost actually plays a, a, quite an important role in this setting to control spring hydrology in, in northern peatlands. So now what we're doing is to use these um, information to target specific field measurements of those missing or under constrained hydrological parameters. And these include these surface water wells that are sitting at the interface between the forest and the, the, the bog that characterizes how um, dynamic the hydraulic gradient is across those landscape units, along with um, nutrient concentration like nitrogen concentrations in these wells that just span very, very short distance from each other because these determine micro this can determine microbial composition rates. Um, and also these canopy cover in the bog, in the forest, these are taken using hemispherical photos that are pointed upwards into the canopy. And you can see how differences in canopy cover can potentially contribute to different levels of snow interception and accumulation underneath them, as well as how insulated they are um, during the spring when they melt. And so we're gonna go out there in the winter time to take these snow depth and soil depth measurements. So to summarize, we showed that water table variations control the seasonal hysteresis of methane emissions. Um, and that these seasonal water table variations are controlled by snowmelt dynamics, frost depth, and hydrological cascades at the watershed scale. And furthermore, that improving hydrological representations in these models will be critical for predicting peatland carbon emissions. So next, we'll turn to a question of how plants respond to their environment, especially under drought. And so the key players are interaction between stomates and xylem and water, and then how they get upscaled into forest level water use. And this is what we call transpiration. This question is motivated by you know, the devastating effect that droughts can have on our ecosystems. Millions of dead trees that you can see here, these are causing power outages, wildfires, like the ones you read in the news. Um, you might also see some of this um, closer to home, this is a case where climate change is making our state increasingly inhospitable to certain species. So in the land surface models that are used to predict um, what happens during the droughts, a lot of the times the way plants use water in, in drought conditions are um, overly simplistic, I'll just say. So if we think about you know, how, what happens during the drought, Plants can transition from well-watered conditions, so this, this is where you have lots of water in the ground that plants can use and take up, to water-stressed conditions. Then they start to close these stomata on the surface of their leaves. And this, you can you know, uh, imagine, it affects how much water gets recycled back into the atmosphere, affects how much plants can, um, can uptake in terms of CO2 emissions. And so this transition is represented by these simple beta functions in land surface models and where the um, transpiration rate or water use rate declines progressively as soil moisture um, declines. And so from right to left. And we know that these simplified functions can be um, inaccurate. They perform poorly during drought and this leads to large uncertainties in our predictions of the carbon cycle. Now, if we take a closer look at what what's going on in the stomata. These, like I said, are small openings on the surface of leaves. You can find them in pretty much all vascular plants on earth. And they regulate the intake of carbon, called carbon assimilation, because plants need carbon to photosynthesize in the leaves and photosynthesis turns these carbon into carbohydrates. But because physically, Water vapor is a smaller molecule compared to CO2. Whenever these stomates are open, you also uh, inevitably are going to lose some water. So you can imagine that when, when the drought hits in, then it will be advantageous to the plants to start closing. them. The problem is that um, 
in order to predict how they're going to respond to future climates, we need simple but prognostic description of stomata behavior. So the beta functions we know are too simple, but we don't want to resort to fully mechanistic approaches because there are lots of um, parameters inside of them that we can't directly measure. And so Aaron and I approach this as an optimal control problem. Uh, the idea that this could be an optimal control problem is not new. It's proposed by Cohen and Farquhar in the 70s, um, who said that they'll assume that stomata function. So that the total loss of water or transpiration during the day is a minimum for the total amount of carbon taken up or carbon assimilation. What is new is that um, Aaron proposed for the first time to use growth rather than carbon assimilation as the objective of that optimization. And this is important because growth is a closer proxy for reproductive success. Um, it's more consistent with the idea of evolution because reproductive success is ultimately what determines what genes get passed down to future generations. So if we look at this as an optimal control problem, we assume that nature will select for stomata behavior that will maximize growth over time. So this is the, the objective function is the integral of growth over time. Uh, stomata behavior is the control variable. And this objective function is subject to this constraint that the carbon inside the plant must be conserved. So carbon storage or changing carbon storage must be balanced by whatever is going in through carbon assimilation in the leaves and whatever gets used up through respiration and growth. Um, assimilation here is going to be controlled by what stomata does, stomata will do. Um, and the CO2 concentration between inside and outside of the leaves, and then transpiration, which enters into this function of growth here and here. Um, it's also determined by stomata behavior along with now the um, uh, vapor pressure gradient between inside and outside of the leaves. And so all of this, when we pose it in this way, can be, it's a constrained optimization problem. So we can solve it using the method of Lagrange multipliers. This is the same method that um, engineers have used to calculate the optimal use of fuels during a flight and many other engineering problems. The solution from this constraint optimization actually give us fairly useful and new descriptions of stomata behavior. So we know that growth optimizing stomata will close under a number of conditions when temperature increases, when atmospheric drought increases. And here we're showing the closure under soil drought. So when, um, well, soil drought and then the closure under elevated CO2 conditions. This is everything we already know. Um, past theory also predict this. But what's new is that now we're able to predict additional things like how growth will nevertheless increase under elevated CO2 despite stomata closure. Um, I'm not showing that here, but, but it also predicts nighttime transpiration. And most importantly, this theory helps explain how trees will die underwater in carbon deprivation during a drought. And that provides us with a biologically accurate uh, modeling basis for predicting future mortality events. So if we turn to another part of the plant physiology, this is the xylem. And like the stomata, this is ubiquitous. You find it in all sorts of plants. And the xylem is a tissue that helps convey water and nutrients from the ground into the rest of the plant following the hydraulic gradient. Um, the problem with the xylem is that it's now internal to the plant. It's internal to the vascular. It's kind of like their circulatory system. They're difficult to measure. And a lot of the times they vary across traits and within species. And so Lou and I approached this using a Bayesian modeling approach using Markov chain Monte Carlo to try to infer what those values are using data that we already have from sat flux. So sat flux is something that relates, that's directly correlated with um, transpiration and we have much more of this, it's easier to measure. So what we do is um, we take those hydraulic parameters, we take some prior information from them we feed that into a model of a tree. This model spits out some estimates of sap flow, which you can see in the red lines here for a paper birch and a white pine. And this is compared against the observed sap flux, which is shown in the black. And MCMC will compare these two time series and propose new updated values for those hydraulic parameters. And if we iterate this through like 
10,000 times, then eventually those values will converge toward a stationary distribution that we call posterior distributions that helps to minimize the mismatch between the estimated and observed set flux um, time series. And so on the left here, I'm showing what those posterior distributions look like. Uh, this is for red maple, paper birch, like a number of species that are found living in the same forest in the northern Michigan. And you can see that you, this approach kind of clearly distinguishes or differentiates between these posterior distributions in terms of uh, this important hydraulic parameter that we call Psi 50. Um, and actually the American Geophysical Union newsletter, EOS, talked about it as uh, a method that opens the way for a better understanding of interspecies and intraspecies variation in the response to large scale climate events. So now finally, let's look at what we can do once we know um, better what the stomates and the, and the xylem um, are doing and then incorporate that into a model. So this is the work of Brandon. Um, what he did is to compare the predictions of transpiration from those uh, beta functions that I showed you earlier against a series of, um, well, just a more complex plant hydraulics model that actually incorporates our understanding of stomata behavior, xylem response into the model itself. And what Brendan, through this comparison, is able to show is that this idealized simple beta model is just a special case of our fully resolved plant hydraulics model. And so this is, um, I'll walk you through this. So this is um, the prediction and transpiration from the, well, prediction of transpiration as it decreases during the soil drought from the beta function, these simple um, down regulation functions that I showed you earlier, and from the plant hydraulics models in red here that kind of spans this shaded area. And Brandon showed that if you take one of the parameters inside the, the hydraulics model, the, the, the hydraulic conductance from the soil into the plant, if you take that parameter to its infinite limit, then this shaded area actually collapsed back into this uh, uh, single line. And so this is saying that the beta model is just a special case of the plant hydraulics model in the limit where you can like instantaneously transport water from the ground into the plant. And that the reason that sometimes these beta models fail to function properly is because it cannot account for that particular feature inside the plant itself. And we can demonstrate this using real data too. So this is the same plot basically plotted as on the left-hand side, but now using data from a real forest. So here is showing that the down regulation of transpiration as soil drought progresses is gonna be a function of what happens in the atmosphere too. So there's a distinction between what happens in the drought and what happens in the air. And this distinction sometimes is not important because they tend to co-occur when it's dry, it's dry everywhere. But sometimes it really is important. Like if you have um, a farmland and you irrigate the crops with water, so it could be dry in the air, but it's well watered in the ground. Or if the forests have access to some deep water storage or groundwater that's decoupled from atmospheric drought. Um, using kind of this new understanding about the difference between soil and atmospheric drought uh, through the use of plant hydraulic models, we can show that this actually improves our predictions of transpiration in drought. Uh, so again, this is the Metellius pine forest in Oregon, uh, where the data comes from. And here in the middle, I'm, I'm showing you the transpiration rates in a kind of average the summer, uh, over, over average summer, summer day, where the data is shown in black, um, the predictions from the hydraulics model is shown in red, and then from the simple beta model is shown in the dashed gray line here. And you can see that the match between data and the hydraulics model is much closer. On the right hand side, we're showing the reduction in percent bias produced uh, of transpiration predicted by plant hydraulics model when compared against the beta model across a range of atmospheric and soil droughts. And then the blue areas are showing places where the um, plant hydraulics model is outperforming the, the beta model. Um, so using all of this new understanding about how plant hydraulic regulation works, 
Brandon is now able to kind of propose some new models that he's calling uh, the dynamic beta model that replicate the performance improvements from the hydraulics model, but without nearly as many parameters. And so he's now kind of replicating some of these, um, these findings uh, across something like 150 sites across the US. So I'll just summarize here by saying that we've shown that optimizing growth instead of assimilation offers a new paradigm for understanding um, a range of new somata behaviors and responses. And then we demonstrated that these difficult to measure hydraulic traits can be inferred from sat flow observations using a Bayesian approach with MCMC. And then by incorporating what we know from the somata and the xylem um, into hydraulic modeling, we can actually improve predictions of transpiration under these divergent conditions of drought between the soil and the atmosphere. Okay, so lastly, I'll just talk about um, the impact of trees and vegetation in urban environments. And this is our newest project. Um, it's funded by the NSF Long-Term Ecological Research Network since last year. And since this fall supported by the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council, and then I'll just show some preliminary results. We um, wanna know about trees because we know that um, they offer a whole range of benefits, but also drawbacks in urban environments. The first thing we can think of is, is, uh, is the fact that trees can help lower surface and air temperature and mitigate the urban heat island effect. And you can see that um, through this thermal image. They, they, they do that through the effect of shading. So you can um, feel cooler under a tree, but also through evaporative cooling. This is something related to how much trees transpire, how much they use water. And so there, this thermal image from a heat wave in Australia is showing that the surrounding areas near a tree are actually much cooler compared to like in the pavement. Trees also um, intercept storm water. And so this study from uh, Northern Wisconsin estimated um, by looking at areas where trees have been cut down, that trees can actually intercept about 2,000 gallons of water per year per tree. But we also know that um, in addition to reducing air temperature and reducing the amount of runoff in urban environments, they can also offer drawbacks. And so this is a study from University of Minnesota showing how um, the street tree canopy across a range of subcatchments in St. Paul is positively correlated with the event scale phosphorus concentration from the storm sewers in those neighborhoods. Um, so this is a case where the nitrogen and, and phosphorus leaching from litters can actually end up in our, our streams and lakes and cause harmful algal blooms. So clearly there's, there's a lot of need to understand how these trade-offs work in urban environments. And to do that, uh, Sha Ting has, um, has been working to develop env environmental sensing systems to measure what trees are doing to provide previously unavailable information on the urban trees. And so she spent countless hours in the electronics lab in, in the earth sciences department at the University of Minnesota. And, uh, and, and, and this is because we need to come up with modular and inexpensive ways to deploy them in urban uh, environments. And this environmental system will consist, well, does consist of sap flux sensors. These again are measuring how much trees are using up water. Uh, this is an early prototype of a microcontroller used for um, recording data and power, power regulation. Uh, I think we're still working on that. Um, this is air temperature and relative humidity sensors so that we can measure the effect on the surrounding microclimate. Um, we also have rain gauge and through fall collectors, both under the tree canopy and in an open area, so we can get a sense of how much rainwater is being intercepted by trees. And we also have soil moisture sensors at different depths so that you can measure um, how much water is stored in the ground and also how uh, deep infiltration, how deep the stormwater infiltrate into the soil. So all of this is, is intended to give us a better picture of how much water is going down and going up in the tree 
And what we've done is um, to have deployed them first this spring in the trees next to, these are the maple trees next to the Washington Avenue garage. Um, and then once we figured that they kind of work, um, we moved to uh, four different parks in St. Paul uh, this summer. And, um, and in the process, we've encountered a lot of people who do use those parks and rec, rec centers that come talk to us about um, what we're doing, like why we're out there with these equipments. And this is actually a pretty good opportunity to do some public outreach and talk to them about why scientists are interested in trees. <laughs> So, um, so this is at the site level. In order to, again, upscale the effects of trees to the watershed scale, what we're doing is partnering with the city of St. Paul through their structured ash removal program. And what these, this program is, um, well, actually, I'll just show you this map. This map is showing the locations where the ash trees are planned to be removed in the next few years, up to uh, 2022, 2023, 2024, um, due to infections through the emerald ash borer. And you might have seen these bands, these green bands or markers uh, along the streets. Uh, and by placing our sensors in parks where we know that ash trees are going to be removed, we can get a sense of what happens before and after their removal in terms of their effect on the surrounding microclimate and how that influences, um, well, actually, as well as how that inf uh, their influence on the, um, the stormwater that are measured through these uh, outlets. And so some of these preliminary data that we have, you can already see that the sap flux or, or transpiration from trees can actually vary from day to day in response to when it rained. And so these are spikes showing when it rained. Uh, and also in terms of, in response to uh, vapor pressure deficit and so how dry the air is. And these are gonna be con uh, connected to what happens at the subcatchment level where the um, stormwater response is measured um, by the Capital Region Watershed District. And so this is still a work in progress. And um, we're using both this kind of a, uh, analytical, statistical an approach to upscale as well as modeling. So, um, so just to summarize here, we've learned in this process that the, the urban environmental monitoring need to overcome a, a, a number of challenges that are um, technical, practical, and people related in nature. And so sometimes you get spurious rainfall records because someone thought that your um, rain gauge was a, a compost bin. And then I didn't, I, I didn't show any results related to this because I wanted to um, leave some time for questions. But uh, we know from other modeling efforts that we're doing in our group that maximizing the benefits of green infrastructure like trees and rain gardens and bioswales this would require thinking about trade-offs in terms of environmental settings. So what kind of rainfall intensities do we expect to see in the future? The location of those green infrastructure within the stormwater network around the city. So if you're located um, downstream or upstream near or far from the water outlet, then those tend to have different effects as well as the outcome. So if we're interested in um, surrounding air temperature reduction, or if we're interested in improving stormwater quality, we have to think about um, explicitly what those trade-offs might be, who are we benefiting, and at what cost. So I'll just, I'll end here um, by thanking all the group members whose work that I showed in this presentation. Jeannie will be starting with us this fall, working on the urban hydrology project, and then um, and to our collaborators, partners, and funding agencies, uh, a big thank you. And this is a picture of us um, this summer at the Bell Museum, uh, introducing middle schoolers to the plant game that is based on the principle of optimization. So this shows that these principles are universal and can be understood at many different levels. Okay, thank you. I'm also happy to take questions. Yeah, so I'll just pass the microphone around. But Shrey can pick who she wants to ask. And maybe Mary can see if there's anyone online that wants to ask a question. So anyone from the audience? Thanks, Shrey. That was a really, really interesting talk. I, you 
put up at one point um, data that was um, differentiated by different tree species, but you didn't say a whole lot about it, just that there were differences. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered um, how deep you can get into the different tree species, how much the trees vary by their hydrologic behavior, because it seemed like they did. Mm -hmm. And if that's something that then can be used to think about reforestation, um, removal of of trees selectively based on species or, you know, thinking about which species might be more sensitive. Mm -hmm. I yeah. just wondered if you were going in that direction at all. Yes. Um, so reforestation efforts actually um, there have been some efforts also at the U to consider how we might preemptively save certain species in the state by transplanting them further north when the effect of climate change hasn't quite reached there yet. And so some of the southern species, they're transplanting up, up north. And they do that by kind of thinking about how trees differ in terms of their water and carbon use strategies. And so, you know, some of us have different habits or work habits and eating habits and the same with trees. Um, they, some of them, if they've evolved in environments that have been exposed to prior droughts or water limitation, they might adopt more efficient ways of taking up water and using water compared to other species that would have, you know, like if they've grown up in the boreal forest and they've never seen a drought and then it's cold up there all the time, then these traits will nat naturally kind of differentiate them in terms of their uh, water uptake strategies, um, sometimes also in terms of nutrient uptake and water and carbon use strategies. And these are questions that scientists or like physiologists are looking into uh, for those purposes of, you know, thinking about where to plant trees as well as just as a, like a fundamental science question. Yeah. What else? Okay. Nikki wants to ask one. Mickey. Thank you. So uh, I think the first part of the talk contributes to a big uh, question in environmental science regarding the, uh, our knowledge about carbon balance. And it is called in the literature, missing carbon link. So researchers, whether they want to admit or not, they don't know how to establish conservation of mass for carbon. And uh, one of the big uncertainties relates to your talk, and I think it's excellent contribution, that would be the sources of carbon from ecosystems by um, uh, bacterial activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really like the way how you represented that, uh, that possibly missing carbon link relates to uh, moisture, that relates to bacterial activities and temperature that again relates to some extent bacterial activity. But can we try to approach this problem in a little bit more mechanistic way, uh, saying that carbon flux scales with the transport of some sort times concentration difference at the ground mm -hmm. and in the air. Although this equation has only three components, it's quite complex mm -hmm. because uh, tra transport is driven by hydrometeorology. Mm -hmm. And you represented several setups with uh, three dimensional ADVs uh, close to the ground surface. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to establish <laughs> that uh, concept considering the wind speed yeah. and stability of the air. On the other side, uh, concentration of the ground is a function of these all suspects. Mm -hmm. And the uh, concentration in the air is a function also of climate change. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, just uh, simply differentiating the uh, flux equation mm -hmm. with respect to these suspects and having a long-term variability of the variables, moisture, temperature, wind, uh, may give you uh, maybe more complete answer Mm -hmm. how carbon fluxes may change if we are aware of the variabilities. Yeah, um, so actually, Nikki, I think I can kind of um, 
decompose your question into multiple ones. <laughs> so yeah, it's true that um, a large of part of our uncertainty related to how to uh, balance the carbon in the air and in the ground. It's related to how much is stored in the ground and how much of that will get released back into the atmosphere. And so there's a component of it where rest, soil respiration in mineral soils can consist a large component of this. There's also a component of this that's related to release from peatlands where um, instead of in mineral soils, we are working with this high carbon content material, peat, um, and how much of that is gonna get released back into the atmosphere. And people are working on both sides of this equation. When it comes to peatland emissions, there are actually um, three main mechanisms of release. And so it's related to diffusion, the transport, uh, uh, that you mentioned. So it relates to how much concentration is in the air spaces in the peat and then how much of it is in the air. Um, there are actually two other <laughs> main ways that carbon can get released and that's through ebullition. So bubbles forming and bursting out and orenchyma transport. So how much plants actually will take up those gases and then fast forward transport them through their um, vessels. And they're, they're all sorts of uncertainties related to that. This is a conversation that I've had with like Sebastian um, in the past about how to model the micro microbial um, activities using things like, um, uh, you know, uh, Michaelis Minton types of population dynamic equations. Um, there are lots of like, you know, um, decomposition pathways that this follows when. Um, when oxygen de depletes, then there's different levels of electron acceptors that can operate in place of oxygen. And so I think the picture is, is um, still a little bit, um, little bit fuzzy in terms of what equations would be the most appropriate in terms of capturing these key processes. But that's certainly something that um, has been looked at um, and I, I think by like talking more to people with the specific expertise that I need, then we'll, we'll uh, make progress in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. That went online. What else? Any more questions? Oh, good. Mine is that one. <laughs> Thank you, Shui. It's about the first part of your presentation. You show, for example, that a very good correlation between the, the methane flux and the soil temperature. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the um, correlation with the what 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 the table elevation. You show the regression coefficient, which is not that great. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you, see, you see a trend. I'm just wondering, in those type of model, is that is that something that you have instantaneous effect, or is there some kind of delay effect? For example, in a, in a in the, in a process like that, if you have a delay mm -hmm. between the cause and the effect, you know, mm -hmm. then establishing a correlation by looking at data would be difficult unless you have a model to back that up. You know? mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. just wondering if you have any comment on that. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so, yeah, it's true that some of these correlative effects are not causal. And in fact, after having done those types of analyses, um, what it generated for us were more questions rather than answers. And the best we could say was, look, we, we see this happening. We need more help in terms of understanding what is going on. Um, and there could be a lot of different microbial and transport processes that are involved in seeing those trends, including the delay effects. And so those um, regress regressions that I showed earlier, they, those are already kind of um, integrating, it's time integrated water table elevations during the, the spring period already. And so it doesn't, it's, it's, it's time integrated, but it's still a snapshot of what's going on at a particular time. It doesn't account for delay effects, but there's certainly potential for delay effects. So we can imagine that if, if water um, delay or um, time explicit effects, and so if water table instead of staying up there for a short period of time, stays up there high, 
for a prolonged period of time, then you might see legacy effects of how much oxygen does not get diffused back into the water column and that could affect the dynamics of populations of microbes that exist to decompose those materials. Um, so if it lasts for longer, then the effect might be uh, much more nonlinear than if you just look at it from snapshots. But um, it's, it's, yeah, it's certainly like opens a lot more questions. And you're right that trying to est establish causal relationships would, would, would require building a model like the one that um, Mickey might have pointed out. So I have a question asked if no one else does. So the, in the, uh, when you were looking at the recycling of the moisture with, in trees yeah. and you did that Monte Carlo model and you showed that there were a difference depending on the species, the distributions you got looked like they were all normal distributions. Is that the case? And would you expect, I'm always looking for power tail distributions, but there's no such thing in that, in those predictions, or would you expect them to be normal or were they normal? Yeah, I wouldn't expect those trait values to have extreme value, well, be covered by extreme value distributions. Um, the posterior, the shape of the posterior distribution will also kind of depend on what we assign as okay. the prior distributions. And the normal distributions that we use for the prior distributions come from um, kind of a smatter of data points that were available collected by other physiologists in the field. And you know, if you only have like three or four samples per species, then, I mean, you could, you, you have to make a decision, right? And so the natural press to make was the normal distribution. So, so you end like up with normal posteriors. Me. Yeah. Any, any other questions from anyone? No one online? Nope. Okay, so let's, let's thank Shui one more time for an excellent talk.